Let me tell you a little story. We were in our office watching the Game Awards. I was mostly just excited about the release of Smash as I saw this trailer which had, well, a ton of things going for it. A beautiful style, a sense of suspense, what more could you ask for? And let me tell you, this is what started it all. To say that this made me a Persona fan would be a massive understatement. I don't know what it was, but once I found out about this franchise, I immediately fell in love with it. I have so many things I want to say about the Persona series, yet I feel like it has been discussed to death. That's honestly the main reason why I never reviewed or talked about Persona deeply on a production. At least with something like Soul Hackers 2, there was a reason and new perspective to make it. Just making a standard production didn't feel like I was serving justice to the franchise. If I'm going to do this, I want to go all out. Fortunately, I have found a solution, and we really hope you guys enjoy it. This is Bunny, and you're watching Personathon. Wait, sir, we're, we're live? Oh, I mean, <laughs> I, I forgot to mention this, but as a small experiment, we're recording this production live for the first time. But as I was saying, this is easily going to be one of our most ambitious productions yet. To celebrate our journey with all of you, I want to make a little retrospective of every mainline Persona game. However, I want my focus to be on three main things. The development history, my personal experience with it, and the impact. This would be a fun way to focus on more of the external factors of the series rather than just the games themselves. Persona as a series has grown a lot for the amount of time it's been around, and a lot of things have happened since its debut. And for the first time in the company's history, we're doing a duo review, meaning we'll be hosting together. First time? Wow. Nevertheless, what a better way to start off today than with Persona 1. Now, this is probably one of the most interesting entries in the series. Many say it's like the odd one out of the Persona franchise, but I never truly understood why. So there has to be something wrong. Why don't we take a closer look then? And as always, be sure to press that red button for future productions from us. This is our review on Persona 1. Alright, let's start with the beginning. Atlas was a developer that created and distributed games for consoles like the NES and SNES. One of their more popular franchises being Shin Megami Tensei, which was initially made for a Japanese audience, later released in the West. This series became incredibly successful and spawned countless spin-offs and sub-series after SNT 2's release. One of those being Shin Megami Tensei If. SNT If had a pretty unique take for the series, focusing more on the troubles of young adults in a Japanese high school setting, rather than your typical fighting demons with different ideologies to save the world. This idea came from the series creator Koji Okada and Kasuma Kanero, stating that almost everyone experiences their life as a student and this can be something they can relate to. And that is a really good point actually. The way a lot of the characters in the series are portrayed make it very easy to connect and relate with. To no one's surprise, the reception regarding SNTF was large enough to convince Atlas to fully create a sub-series around this style, though so, there's been a few changes. One of those being an underlying focus on psychology and the human mind and soul. This can be seen in each game one way or another and has become a staple in the franchise. When developing this title, the main direction was to make it as close as traditional Mega 10 but making it also accessible to newcomers for the series. The game's development even went as far as to nearly put ST Nocturne's release to a halt. Wow, <laughs> they must have had a lot of faith in this one. But soon after, the game as we know now as Revelations Persona was released on September 20th, 1996. Before we get into the story, I want to mention one more thing, the PSP release and localization. You see, Persona was made during a time where Japanese-centric games were a bit more of a niche and relatively new to American audiences. For this reason, the PS1 Western release has gone through several changes to be more appealing to the West. Now what were these alterations you ask? Well, to name a few, they changed all of the characters, location names, a ton of Persona and Demon Shadow names, protagonist's hairstyle, ethnic origins, some dialogue, and the most infamous, removing an entire section of the game. The only one of these changes I truly do have a problem with is the removal of the Snow Queen quest. Apparently, the reason it was never included was because they had a deadline to get it out for the end of the year, and on top of that it had major glitches. Luckily, we did eventually get a PSP release in 2009 for Japan and North America in the title of Shin Megami Tensei Persona. This port was designed to be more true to the original release of the title. They balanced a few things, used the original Persona, Shadow, character and location names, brought back the Snow Queen quest, added back most of its dialogue, new and redone anime cutscenes, new UI, a huge amount of quality of life changes, and so, so 
so many more to the point that we can make an entire production about it on its own. The PSP version is going to be the game I'm going to take most of my thoughts and review from since, in my opinion, it's the most definitive way to play this title. Anyway, that's enough on the overall summary of its history. Let's start with the story. Minty? Uh, it's Captain? Uh... Right. Why don't you explain the story? Certainly. Alright, so the story takes place in Mikage Cho. You, an unnamed protagonist, and your classmates play a game called the Persona game. However, by playing this, a massive turn of events happen. Soon after, we meet Philemon, a being that lives inside the consciousness and unconsciousness of a human being, and is also our guide throughout this journey. He also gives us the ability to summon a Persona, a power that helps us control one's self-reflection and comments how we're gonna need it for what's to come. After all that, the group decides to check on one of their friends, Maki Sonomura, who was at the hospital due to an illness. It's up to this point where we start to see strange activity going on in the city. Maki's room has gone off a sudden and monsters, otherwise known as shadows and demons, are attacking and the only way to take them down is through the power of Persona. As we progress more through the story thanks to the help of Sasuko Sonomura, also known as Maki's mom, we start to fit all the pieces together and realize that reality has been split into two. One is basically the same where the main cast lives, but the other is a world that was supposedly made by Takisha Kandori, the president of Subex Mikage Cho branch. You see, Kandori has been using a machine that Maki's mom has been developing called the Diva system to warp reality to his own will. So it's up to us now to take him down using the power of our personas. Oh, and I also forgot to mention, it's around these previous events where we do eventually meet up with Maki, who is surprisingly fine? Kind of? She does have a few issues remembering what happened, but we don't really think too hard about it. Until we get to the other part of the story, which is more centered around Maki as a character. Maki is a girl who has been sick for most of her life and it has been stated in the beginning that she's been hospitalized for over a year. This gave her severe damage to her mental health but always tries to escape that by going to her so-called ideal world. That's who this Maki is. Kandori didn't just want to create a new world with a diva system. It created one that was made up of Maki's dreams while also kidnapping the real one and splitting her into three different beings. The ideal Maki who helps us throughout the journey and helped two younger versions of her, Mai and Aki, representing the inner innocent and guilty sides of her respectively. With all this together, it is up to you, your classmates, the ideal Maki, and soon Mai to stop Kandori from hurting the real Maki and eventually ending humanity, but we don't talk about that. So we just defeated Kandori and the game is over, right? Huh. <laughs> What did you think this was? A movie? No, it can't end like this. This is Persona we're talking about. Here's something that you need to keep in mind about these games. They like to give a lot of build up to this antagonist and make a grand finale for it, only to completely take that off the rails and have you fight a god. Whether this is a good thing or not, completely up to you. Anyways, after defeating Kandori, we eventually told to defeat the true cause of all this, Pandora, a god and part of Maki's heart that wants to use the diva system to kill and destroy everything. So it is up to you now and your friends to finally defeat her and bring things back to normal. Thankfully, after hours upon hours of pure grinding, we defeat her. The world is returning to its original state. Your friends and everyone are going back to their respective worlds. And most importantly, Maki. She has become the one who she wanted to be and is able to hang out with her friends now, living her own and ideal self. Oh geez, this went on longer than I expected. And this is just one half of what the game has to offer. Yes, I kid you not, there's two different storylines. The one I just explained is called the Sebek Route, the other is the Snow Queen Quest. To keep things short, I'll keep most of my opinions from the Sebek Route. Now then, what are my thoughts? I love the story. It's weird, I wasn't expecting it to be this good, but it's generally like really heartwarming. It has a certain tone going on with being very scary, lonely, and also eerie in general. Yet, it's really charming. Other than your classmates, there's not really a lot of people around Mikage Cho. That, combined with the underlying themes of this game, it brings in quite a unique experience. It explores concepts like coming to senses about yourself and your morals. It's fine if you're not the ideal version you dream about. About. Nobody's perfect after all. Maki is the perfect representation for this and just an overall really good character. Seeing her overcome these obstacles, having the chance to be with her friends again, and seeing the world where she is now happier than ever is absolutely beautiful. As for the rest of the cast, eh, they're alright I guess. 
My only real issue here is that they don't get as much development compared to Maki. Don't get me wrong, there's still some interesting characters like Nanjo. It's just one of those cases that there could have been more, you know. And as for Kandori as a villain, well, he's alright. He mostly boils down to Big Bad CEO number 41, with a twist that he becomes a god, but still, just a little bit generic for me. I will admit though, the fact that he's also a Persona user and it gets revealed during his boss fight, that's pretty cool. And I think that's about it for the story. Hey Bunny, you're up now. Gameplay. Side note, I do expect most people watching to have played at least one entry of the Persona series. This is so I don't have to explain the basic mechanics in the upcoming episodes. I'll go over them here so we understand the foundation. Persona 1 overall plays very similar to many JRPGs, especially ones made by Atlas at the time. You can run around, talk to characters, check out different locations, and most importantly, fight enemies to level up. There's three main ways to locate the maps, those being first-person view for dungeon crawling, third-person in battles, and this overhead view when traveling through a city. Fighting enemies is easily where the game stands out the most. Battles play out in turns, but you have this grid-like system. Here you can do your basic attack, use a gun, analyze for any weaknesses, and even change the order of party members. What's new here is being able to utilize your persona. Personas essentially give you a wider range of skills to use, ranging from physical attacks that use up your HP to magic spells that require SP. You'll mostly be trying to figure out the weakness of a certain enemy to try and abuse it. Despite being enemies, if you try contacting them, there's a chance that they can become part of your persona. All you need to do is talk to them in a way their personality likes. If you get it right, they become a part of your team. Scaring them will only end the battle, making them eager can give you an item, and angry will make them fight back. There is room for error though, so say you get them a bit scared but happen to make them fully happy. By doing this, they'll still decide to be on your team. This is honestly one of my favorite mechanics in the game. Just seeing what kind of personalities these shadows or demons have is really charming, and the amount of things you can do to them is insane. You can taunt, flirt, speak in some attitude, all kinds of stuff really. But if you want to go the extra step and make these personas stronger, that's where you get to meet Igor. Oh wow, so he's been kind of a staple this whole time. So here you can essentially do your usual fusing of two or more personas to make them stronger and choose what skills to give them. Or you could use tarot cards, which you can get from talking to the demons and get a specific persona. This is incredibly crucial as you progress the game. You're able to carry quite a few in this game too. All your party members can use more than one persona. This is pretty neat, though it does make setting up a team really tedious. Think about it, everyone can use personas, which is great, but at the same time you have to properly sort out and make a powerful one every now and then, or else they'll be too weak for later dungeons. But maybe that's just me. In terms of how this grid layout works, characters positioned on one half of it will only be able to attack enemies that reach them. Meaning that if you want Kenji to attack this one enemy here, you'll need to change his position with someone else and have them replace his original spot. The battle system as a whole is really fun. All characters do their attack within one turn, so it's fun to think about the amount of damage you can do in one go. It's a bit tedious at times, but in general, I didn't see this game as that difficult when fighting. But that doesn't justify how much this game reeks of old school JRPG design. I mean, seriously. Seriously. Maybe this shouldn't be a point of criticism, but I got into so many fights by just simply exploring around. I could be walking between two spaces on the map and the game brings me an enemy I didn't fully heal for. I get that random encounters were common around this time, but even then I wasn't expecting it to be this bad. It's not even the system itself, it's just the fact that I have to waste more time on some weak enemies when I'm trying to travel. Don't even get me started on moving around in the dungeons. The controls feel so slippery. And that's not all, I strongly advise anyone playing to use a guide. Progressing through the story heavily relies on following the dialogue. It can be super easy to get lost in these dungeons too, so trying to replay for a casual run can be a nightmare. Other than that, there's not much else to mention here. Persona 1 has some pretty simple things going on, which are what make it great. Graphically, the game looks decent enough. It gives off a dark and lonely feeling while still hopeful with the cast you hang out with. The pre-rendered cutscenes are easily my favorite part. They're mainly used for the more important plot points, but they're still a treat to watch. Finally, the music. This is probably where its fans get the most divided. With Persona 1 being remastered for the PSP, the soundtrack for this game was changed, turning it to a more J-pop and bouncy tone. I'm assuming this was to give it a bigger appeal to the people who just played Persona 3 and 4, which is fine if you ask me. However, Atlas didn't really bother giving the option to use the originals, which is weird considering Persona 2 Innocent Sin, another remaster on PSP, does let you play between the newer original soundtrack. 
What do I think in this whole debate? Well, you're talking to someone who loves TMS and anything with a J-pop soundtrack. What do you think I was going to say? Yeah, I'm saying it, I played through this whole game with the PSP OST, and I adore every moment of it. The music here is just so good. Lost Forest and the opening song for this game have to be my favorite tracks. As for the PS1 version, though, I can completely understand why people want it back. There's a certain eerie feeling that comes with it, and with playing the game, having to attack enemies in this weird world created from someone's dreams, it's quite an experience. Persona 1 really has a set tone for it, and that's what I love about it. Relevation's Persona became an instant success, selling over 200,000 copies just within the first week. Not bad for a new IP if I do say so myself. It even remained as the best-selling Persona game in the first week until... Um... We'll get to that until it's ready. But anyways, the game did super well and even critically, getting 8 and 10s for its setting, story, and gameplay. Soon, a few years later, it got its PSP release with a very similar amount of success on it. It didn't reach the same number of sales, but it was praised for fixing a lot of the issues people had with the original game. Persona 1 also got a manga around 1996 and soon reissued for 2009, retelling a few of the events of the game. Oh, and even as a fun fact, it got a mobile game release. Released in 2006, Atlas and BBMF, a mobile game company, developed a game called Persona, Chapter of the Foreign Tower of Emptiness. From what I can gather, it's mostly just a dungeon crawler utilizing locations of the game itself. Nothing groundbreaking, but quite interesting to see. I'm going to be real with you. It's honestly amazing to believe what came from this entry. The thing with Persona 1 is that even with fans, this game isn't really seen in the best light. Watching other people's productions ranking these games, it's always been the lowest. Even called the black sheep of the series, which after playing it, I just have more questions than answers. Persona 1 shouldn't feel or be treated as this separate entity or unwanted child within these other great games. Is it dated by today's standards? Definitely. Is it a different beast from what came after? Absolutely. If I had to describe Persona in one word, it would be... mysterious. It's hard to really know what to expect, and it was kind of unsettling throughout. But the more of it you play, the more you start to fully appreciate what the game has accomplished. I loved the music, the characters, and the story shows a lot of that charm. And the gameplay? Well, it's not the best, but I can still respect what it has going for it. It all still felt like a Persona game. I guess the reason I'm being this forgiving to it is because it was the first from this franchise. It's a time where developers, writers, directors are all experimenting with what the series would eventually turn into. Revelations, or Persona 1, is a game that I will always respect for what it does and what it has done. While I don't think it's the peak of the franchise, it will always have a special place in my heart. Tune in next time where I look over what some may argue is the magnum opus of the franchise. And as always, this is Akari Oe from Minjoy Pictures. This is Bunny. And Captain. From Minjoy Pictures.